East Belfast looks peaceful today. But 40 years ago, daily life at the local secondary school was not so quiet. Lesnashara in the late 60s was a large secondary intermediate school with over 700 pupils. The school was situated in a relatively peaceful area, but a lot of its pupils came from estates which were home to hardline loyalist extremists. This was to make life difficult for the new head teacher. Well, my name's Ernest Cave. Went to Lisnashara in 1968, a marvellous school, but the troubles were starting. I got a phone call, my children were stoning the Catholic buses. So I got in my car and drove along the dual carriageway. And there were all the lads in the wee green blazers throwing stones at the buses from the Catholic school going along the carriageway. The uh, police came, so they stoned them. And then the army came, so they stoned them. So then I came and they disappeared like rabbits. These wee green blazers just disappeared. And the officer with the army couldn't believe it. He said, what, who are you? I said, I'm the headmaster. He said, but when you came, they just disappeared off the face of the earth. He said, what kind of authority have you that they did this? And I said, I don't have any authority myself. It's the school's authority. And I happen to be, represent the school. Mr Cave wrote to all the parents warning how damaging these events were for the school and asking for family support in bringing the trouble to an end. Everything in the area was their Protestant heritage. It was their school. And I played on that, that it was their school, not my school. Every day there were more reminders that Northern Ireland was a divided community. John Time Radio News headlines. A married man's been shot dead at his home in Londonderry. He was 35 and he died when two gunmen fired eight shots through his front door. In Belfast there have been three petrol bomb attacks. The abiding memories for getting your porridge in the morning, listening to the latest catalogue of dead and destroyed, and at the same time, uh, my father was working in uh, Harlem Wolf and there was no work in the shipyard. All the certainties, all the anchors that made them what they are were disappearing. Tensions between Catholics and Protestants in Belfast were rising, and it didn't help that the children were going to different schools. There was never any uh, reason why Catholic pupils should not attend state schools. I mean, the state schools were set up for everybody. But in the event, because the Catholic Church tended to uh, provide its own schools, the number of Catholics attending any schools such as ours was very limited indeed. In the early 1970s, the Loyalist extremists started flexing their muscles. The group of houses nearest to us that would have been quite difficult would have been over here, which is now known as Clonduff, and further on up the Ballygown Road, which is known as Ryan Park. And families were moved into there when Lord Street and Madrid Street, there was riots and bombings. As a result of intimidation and violence, many Catholic families left East Belfast and Protestant families from the other side of the city moved into the vacant houses. They did switch over, in other words. So I inherited these pupils uh, who had been evicted from West Belfast. And, of course, there were uh, paramilitary elements began to emerge in various estates and so on. And uh, there was a different discipline being applied outside the school to young people than there was inside the school. To complicate matters, the two main estates were controlled by rival paramilitary organisations. 
one estate was UDA and the other one was UVF and they were at enmity. And uh, the problem was to make sure that that didn't spill over into the school. There was a, a real battle going on in the evenings uh, between the two factions. I was sitting in my office and uh, two fifth year pupils were knocked at the door and came in and said we were sent down for fighting. And uh, I paused for a while and looked at them and I said, well, tell me this, was this fight, fifth year pupils don't usually fight, and you know, what I said to them, but you two were fighting in the playground, and that's a bit unusual. Tell me this now. Has this anything to do with the conflict between the paramilitaries and the two estates? They looked at each other and then said yes. So I said to them, well, look, I, I have no control over what you do in the evenings uh, at all. But once you come into this school, it's neutral territory. Now, as members of the paramilitary, they were under strict instructions not to get into any rise in school. That was a laid down principle. <laughs> laid down principle, most maybe me. <laughs> I'm Liz McBride, and I started Lesson Sharon in 1971 as a newly qualified teacher. During the time of the Troubles, the most important thing, and maybe beyond the troubles, the most important thing for young people is stability and security. And when you think about that and think of the effect that you have on children, because teachers undoubtedly down through years in any school have a, a, a very great effect. The paramilitaries were virtually running the local community. Their leaders decided to call on Mr. Cave. He had a visit from some of the local heavies. Whatever he said to them, it must have been a, quite a miracle he worked because they went away again and shortly, about a week later, they came back with masses of stuff which had been pinched from the school uh, by some of the local youngsters, including uh, I don't know how many skeleton keys to get into the school. So, uh, you know, he worked a miracle, a real miracle. I remember having five pupils in and uh, they were members of paramilitary groups. You know, when I, I uh, said, what are you? And he said, you see, they start, at, I think they start in major generals and work upwards <laughs> in, in, in paramilitaries. And the first one you see said, I'm the local commander. And, we went on down. They were also, of course, told that when if uh, the headmaster tries to question you, you, you fix on a point above his head and you never catch his eye. You, you talk to him like that, you see, which is quite off-putting. But except that uh, when they did that to me, I just got in the chair, you see, and stood in the chair and said, no, just keep looking the way you were. <laughs> you, you have to have you know, they have to have a sense of humour dealing with situations. All the staff needed a good sense of humour as school life was continually disrupted. Now, the, the main thing that would have affected us were hoax phone calls. And the hoax phone calls were made by friends of the pupils who hoped the school would be closed and they would get home for the day. We had a spate of bomb scares and very good secretary, Olive, uh, and she got this. Uh, the phone call would come. And she was quite quick. She would say, is this a real, is this a real thing or is it a hoax? It's only a hoax, miss. <laughs> phone went down. I thought I had found a bomb in the school. <laughs> uh, me and my friend uh, had gone into the toilets one day and we'd heard this ticking sound. There was an incinerator in the girl's toilet and it was switched on that morning and that made crackly sounds. We genuinely, honestly thought this might have been a bomb. And this was the time that the IRA sent off bombs by putting alarm clocks in them. The bomb squad arrived with the robot. 
course, <laughs> it actually turned out to be the sanitary talents in <laughs> your later, but so next day, you know, Mr. Cave, we were ordered into his office and uh, Mr. Cave told me, Miss Rogers, please get your mother to teach you the facts of life, you know. <laughs> In 1974, the Protestant community no longer trusted their politicians. The province was brought to a standstill by a massive strike. Local paramilitaries again visited the school. Three of them came in. They had valet clavers, they had uh, combat jackets, they were obviously in for... Why did we not close to support the workers' strike? One of them came forward and asked the questions. The other two stood behind them with their hands, stuck in their jerkins, you see, ominously. But you keep everything light. You, you, you know, you don't, you don't get excited and you don't shout and you speak softly, so now and again they have to say, sorry, <laughs> what did you say? Fortunately, the one who was spokesman gave me his name and uh, I said, oh, you're a brother of so-and-so who had been through the school. And I said, what's he doing now? And he said, he's got a job in Muntons, which was the local shirt factory. And I said, well, it's all right, you see, for the one who's got a job and is working in, in, in Muntons, uh, you know, but I have all the children to think of. I kept open. And there was no power. Well, actually, we were able to boil water because in the science room we turned on the, you know, the bought some burners and, and boiled water there for them and, and heated soup and, you know, things like that. Young people were manning the barricades, some young people. Um, and we got on with it. My feeling about those times would have been that school was a normal situation and we had to keep it a more normal situation. It was always made very clear that any issue that was going on outside stopped at the school door. So therefore while the, the whole spiritual dimension was still important and there was very much a spiritual dimension, particularly through the assemblies, it was very much a non-branded spirituality. By and large, the school succeeded in being a pretty good haven because there were a lot of young lads that were on the fringes or being drawn in there into paramilitarism. The school in general tried to keep clear of that. And I think in, in, the, in those terms, probably succeeded quite well. Through the troubled years that followed, Lisnashara remained a haven from the continuing violence. But as time passed, pupil numbers began to fall, and it was the same troublesome estates that were eventually to lead to the school's closure. They build a housing estate, and families are housed in it with children. I mean, that's one of the conditions. And then they say, oh, we need a school. The children move on. Mum and Dad stay, so it sinks down. It's inevitable. The estates were now full of older couples. Birth rates had fallen, and Lisnashara faced increased competition from other schools. <laughs> Lisnashara closed in June 2008. But perhaps its closing is a sign of Northern Ireland moving on. In recent years, a new integrated school has opened nearby. It seems Lisnashara could not shake off its troubled past.